Hi everyone, my name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean of Chicago Booth and also the George Schultz Professor of Accounting. I'm delighted to welcome you to Virtual Reconnect 2020. Um, this is a Reconnect like no other. Uh, while the program may look different, uh, in true Chicago tradition, it allows us to combine the school's strengths. The ability to stimulate and influence thought and practice through spirited debate and rigorous inquiry with our desire to strengthen further the school's close connection with our alumni, all of you on today. So before I give you an update on the school, I wanted to underscore the strength of our global alumni network and extend my gratitude to our 255 reunion volunteers. So as Booth graduates, I think one of the things that you take pride in, we take pride in, is that all of you know how to meet a challenge and how to find creative solutions. So our volunteers started working last fall uh, with every expectation that they would celebrate the reunion in the spring in person. Uh, but circumstances changed and we moved to this format. But as we did so, the volunteers were incredibly helpful in making the switch. Uh, the booth staff and our alumni volunteer leaders have together curated an amazing lineup for the next 24 hours. So I'm just going to give you some of the highlights that, uh, that you're all in for. So there's going to be a keynote discussion uh, with professors uh, Nick Epley and Richard Taylor from our behavioral science faculty. Uh, there's going to be a student panel with the Deputy Dean Star Marcello, who oversees our full-time and part-time MBA programs. There's going to be experiential leadership workshops with our executive MBA team. Uh, we have back to the classroom sessions with professors Linda Ginzel and Mike Gibbs. Uh, and tomorrow we have a Distinguished Speaker Series event with uh, Griffin Myers, co-founder and chief medical officer of Oak Street Health. So now I'd like to give you a brief update on how the school is weathering the current environment uh, and share some exciting things that are happening. We'll have plenty of times for uh, questions from the audience afterward. So in the midst of everything that's been going on around the globe, our top priority has been to keep our core activities progressing so that we'll continue to deliver on our mission, which is the same as it's been for the past 120 years, to produce knowledge with enduring impact and to influence and educate current and future leaders all over the world. So since the pandemic began earlier this year, everybody, uh, students, faculty, staff, alumni, uh, the Dean's office, uh, and, our, and our wonderful global community, everybody has come together to continue to support that mission in truly remarkable and very innovative ways. We have remained focused on supporting our faculty in carrying out their important research and in conducting our pedagogical mission, which is to bring students to booth and to teach them or to educate them remotely as the case may be. The key to our success this year has been and will continue to be our ability to be flexible, to stay calm, to deal with uncertainty and to pivot as needed. So just a few highlights, if you think about it on the faculty side, of course, for a school like us, our ability to attract and retain the best faculty in the world is a, is a key to our success. It's a key to our global reputation. Uh, we were fortunate in that we were able to complete faculty recruiting uh, by the end of February this year. And we welcomed 10 new faculty members this academic year, uh, including two uh, senior faculty whom we hired from outside as full professors. So we hired Alex Todorov from uh, Princeton, uh, the psychology group there into our behavioral science faculty. Um, and we hired Matt Noto from Northwestern's uh, economics department. Um, uh, and Alex is a, is a superstar in uh, psychology. Uh, he won uh, the award that's given to sort of early career uh, success in that field. Uh, he was the winner a year ago. Uh, interestingly, the winners for the two years prior to that were also Booth faculty, uh, Nick Epley and Islet Fishbach. So we have the last three winners of the most prestigious award in, uh, in psychology. Uh, Matt Noto used to be a junior faculty at Booth, uh, left because he got early tenure uh, at Northwestern. Uh, and we are thrilled to say that we were able to get him back to come this year. And he and Dan Edelman are actually uh, co-sharing a new healthcare initiative at Booth to both support our students, to stimulate faculty research in the area, and to provide a focal point that alumni can, uh, can connect to. So you'll hear a lot more about that as we, uh, as we go forward. So at this point, with the recruiting success that we have had, uh, we have 154 tenure line faculty in the school. 
Um, just as a contrast, when uh, in a July 2017, which is when, when I came to the school, we had 135. So this is a significant uh, jump in the number of faculty we have had. And this 154 is the highest number of tenure line faculty in the history of the school. And I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that uh, across the board, this is the highest caliber of faculty the school has ever had. And, and I appreciate that that's a high, high standard for us to, uh, to, uh, to compare to, just given the incredible history the school has had. But I think it's fair to say we've done really, really well in terms of the, of the faculty side. Um, on the student side as well, our full-time and part-time students uh, began dual modality learning in September. So this is this is a hybrid structure that we put in, and it allows us to provide a combination of in-person, socially distanced classes as well as remote learning, and sort of combine them. So the full-time class, which began in uh, September, is composed of a wonderful group of students, a very diverse, incredibly talented group of 620 students, uh, which is our largest class to date. Um, I wanted to acknowledge for uh, for everyone that today in the U.S. is Veterans Day and Remembrance Day in Canada. Military veterans are an incredible asset to the Booth community. Uh, and it's a group of students that we have placed a lot of special efforts to, to try to increase their population in the Booth community. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that thanks to our increased recruitment efforts, thanks to the generosity of Booth donors who have been providing uh, us with the ability to give scholarships for military veterans, there has been a nearly 300% increase in veteran MBA students since 2006. Uh, and in fact, I believe in the full-time class just this year, the I think 6% of the entering class was actually military veterans. So that's something we're incredibly uh, proud of. Um, one of my goals coming in as Dean to Booth has been to deepen our connection to uh, the college and as well as to the broader university. You know, I think I've mentioned before, this is something that Bob Zimmer was very, very keen that I, that I do. Um, and I think it's fair to say that's gone very well, probably well beyond uh, our expectations at this point. So at the graduate level, one of the new programs we launched this year uh, is a new three-year JD MBA. So uh, this is a combination degree <clears throat> where you get, excuse me, um, your MBA from Chicago Booth, uh, as well as your law degree from uh, University of Chicago's law school. Um, so this is a program that uh, Tom Miles at the, at the law school and I worked on for the past couple of years to try to figure out, is there a way to sort of bring together more synergies across the schools, enable students to be able to complete the program in, uh, in a relatively short period of time? And we were very proud to launch a three-year JD MBA as of this September. So for people outside the US, uh, in the US, the JD degree alone takes usually three years. Uh, but we were able to do a lot of sort of cross counting of classes. Uh, we were able to set up summer classes at Gleacher for, for students interested in the program. And we were able to put together this new three year joint degree program. And it's taken off uh, very well. Our sort of aspiration was that we would eventually get to about 15 to 20 students. Uh, we hit, you know, 14 students right away in year one. And just looking at the demand for it going forward, we're getting incredible uh, demand for it for next year's class as well. So I suspect that we'll be able to ramp this up incredibly well. And this is a program, as I said, I'm very, very proud of. Uh, the other way in which we've been trying to connect to the university is through more teaching of undergraduates. Now, I'm sure when many of you were at Booth or, at, or the GSB, um, by definition, right, GSB was the graduate school. And there really wasn't much emphasis on teaching undergrads at UChicago. Uh, but this is something, again, we have been uh, emphasizing quite a bit. Uh, you may recall that two, two and a half years ago, we put together a new undergraduate major uh, in connection with the economics department called business economics. So you come into U Chicago, you do the sort of standard liberal arts curriculum in the first year, then you take core classes in the econ department at the university, and then you take elective classes at Booth. So this is, again, a phenomenal sort of program uh, if you think about you know, what uh, an incoming freshman at U Chicago would be interested in. Um, but I have to say, again, this has succeeded beyond any of our wildest dreams. So this year, for example, we are offering 20 undergraduate courses 
43 sections of undergraduate teaching and something like 2100 students will be taking classes. So these are you know undergrad only sections of booth classes taught by booth faculty and the demand has been overwhelming. Uh, it would not surprise me if by next year uh, this were the number one major at the University of Chicago. And again, it's pretty amazing if you think about the fact that we began uh, just three years ago. So this has been a huge success in terms of student demand. Our faculty love teaching these undergrads. Uh, and increasingly, our faculty are using the undergrads to do uh, to become their research assistants. We're thinking about them as potential pipelines to our PhD program and so on. Uh, but in any event, the connections that this program has established with the university have been incredibly strong. Um, it's been a big positive for the university too. They are now attracting new students to U Chicago who might otherwise never have considered coming to Chicago. And in particular, somebody who might have gone to a school like Wharton to do an undergrad in business, this is a way better degree and the demand for this has been overwhelming uh, in terms of how we are able to attract the best students to, to come into that. Um, we've also been, I think, reasonably creative in coming up with new ways to connect with that, with that college audience. So this, again, this year we launched for the first time a new program called the Maroon Scholars. So this is a group of, I think, 34 or 35 uh, exceptional U Chicago student undergrads who came straight to Booth the summer following their graduation from the college in the spring. So the plan is that they will attend one year of the MBA program. So they're in the MBA program this year, but they will then leave to gain full-time work experience and they can come back to Booth to finish their MBA or, or do it through one of our uh, you know evening or weekend programs or something like that. Again, we launched this interestingly in May we were able to get the class in by June um, and the demand for this again has been uh, fantastic. So overall, I would say our notion of connecting with the university has gone extremely well. It's been a win-win and I suspect that we will continue to do more along that vein going forward. Um, about our overseas uh, campuses, so in March, we moved to our spectacular new London campus. I say moved even though if you think about it in March, we were unable to physically actually move, although we were scheduled to at that point. Uh, it's a spectacular new building. It's located at one Bartholomew Close in Bart Square, uh, literally a block from St. Paul's Cathedral. In fact, from the uh, from from all of we have three floors there, and from the corners you can actually see straight through to St. Paul's. The view is amazing. So it's right in the heart of the city. And the, the goal of having this new campus, the goal of all the efforts that we put in to fit it out is basically to affirm our continued commitment to our executive MBA program, uh, as well as to non-degree executive education programs. And more generally, to essentially say that, look, this is going to be our, our headquarters in London. Now, the goal of the headquarters is not just to have a vibrant presence in London for the sake of people there, it's also for that to become the hub of all the efforts that we do across EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So our, our hope is that you know once the lockdowns lift, uh, we'll be able to move back into the building fully, and we'll probably do a formal opening of the building sometime next year once once we're through the uh, the pandemic. So how are we dealing with the pandemic in other ways? So clearly we have had lots of travel restrictions. We haven't been able to go and do the uh, whole bunch of events that we had in mind, including, for example, the opening of the, the London campus. We also have social distancing guidelines in place. So one thing we're doing is to take advantage of technology to reach out and connect with students and with our alumni. Uh, just a few examples, you know, we did uh, virtual economic outlook events. We did them in Hong Kong, London, Chicago. Uh, we've been doing virtual distinguished speaker series events. Um, and to be honest, we've actually found this easier to be able to uh, get onto people's calendars if they are doing the events via Zoom rather than having to fly in and out. We had uh, a full series of alumni participating in these events in the spring. Uh, we had, for example, Tom Ricketts from the Cubs. Uh, we had Byron Trott. We have Jenny Scanlon, Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft. We've done a few this autumn as well, including events specifically tailored to, to EMEA or to Asia. We had Anne Mukherjee from Perno Ricard. We had JP Gan. We had Dave McLennan, CEO of Cargill. So that's gone, you know, incredibly well. 
Uh, we've been doing the Road to Economic Recovery series that, uh, that Randy has been working on. And Randy, of course, also uh, did this, the phenomenal corporate social responsibility revisited event for the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, Milton Friedman's op-ed in the New York Times. And this was done as an event that, that began in, in Asia, sort of then moved to uh, the European time zone and then ended up in Chicago. It, it was a huge success. So Randy did a fantastic job putting that together. Uh, we're also doing a lot of small group alumni events with booth faculty. So typically, I would sort of you know have a faculty member and I would uh, interview them with, with a group of alumni who have an interest in that kind of research, right? Who are interested in supporting that alumni's, uh, that faculty member's work. So I've done events with Richard Taylor, with uh, Sendil Mullenathan, uh, one with Amir Sufi, uh, Ralph Koijan, and we have a, a few more coming up. And again, we're doing some events for uh, the American uh, time zone, but also others for, for Europe and Asia. So stay tuned to that. Couple things just about uh, the situation of the school financially. Uh, you've all read probably that when the pandemic hit for universities everywhere, uh, this has been a time of significant belt tightening and the university has imposed uh, wage and, and hiring freezes for staff. Uh, we don't really have a freeze for the faculty, but, but we, we sort of have a high bar if we wanna hire somebody. Um, and we've also as a school, you know, gone through all of the departments and all the departments have been great at sort of, you know, uh, putting off new hiring, making budget cuts as needed. Uh, we were very lucky as a school and as a university that we were able to finish our capital campaign back in December, right? Thankfully, before the, uh, the pandemic actually hit. Um, so nevertheless, you know, there have been things that have affected our financials. So if you think about it, all of the non-degree executive education programs that we would do uh, have essentially come to a halt. Right? Nobody's traveling, nobody's sending groups of 50 executives to come to Chicago and take classes. So Execed has been pivoting to more of an online custom model, and, and that's actually going well, but you know, there's clearly a, a time lag before that can catch up to uh, what the projections were for, uh, for Execed before the pandemic. Uh, also, you know that we use the Gleacher Center as a hub for everything we do in Chicago. Uh, we lease it out to corporations to do their events. And of course, all of that has sort of ground to a, to a halt as well. Uh, we also had to move out the executive MBA program, which normally would begin in June. We had to sort of move it out to late August, early September. So all those you know, had a financial impact on the school. Um, the university overall last year lost about $200 million. Uh, Booth, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say, continued to make a surplus, but we were short of what the targets were that we had, we had agreed on, uh, although by, by not that much. Um, why is that? Well, because we've had some positive signs as well. Um, our applications, uh, just are very interesting, we set an all-time record for applications this past year. Um, I think some people thought maybe the year 99 to 2000 might have been similar, but in any event, certainly in the last 20 years, this was the highest number of applications that we have received. We had a record number of applications in our third round, which was in the spring. Uh, and as I said, a full class. Uh, similarly, we have seen huge increase in interest in students attending our part-time programs. Um, so in the weekend program, students who would otherwise have been flying in and out of Chicago every week, they've been able to take more classes remotely, and this has proven to be very, very popular. So on the student side, we've done well. Uh, we have not changed our tuition model. Uh, you know, we, we, we're sort of charging the same tuition that we did before, um, and none of our peers have either, for, for that matter. Uh, so that's gone well. Also fundraising, uh, even for the prior year, which ended June 30, we ended up uh, exceeding our goals for that, uh, for that period. So as a school, we haven't had to make staff cuts. We haven't done layoffs, furloughs, or anything like that. Uh, we've been very careful with our expenses and making sure that we're being thoughtful as we try to get through this, uh, this pandemic. Um, just a, a brief mention of some other things that we're working on for the coming year. Uh, one of my big goals has been to increase scholarship support across all of our MBA programs. And as you know, uh, we have the boundless scholarship program with the, uh, with the matching for scholarship gifts. That's going well, and we plan to continue doing that for at least the next year or two uh, to make sure that we have a broad enough endowment base from which we can give scholarships. Uh, we put together a plan of action to strengthen diversity and inclusion at Booth. 
Uh, that's on our website, and that encompasses sort of faculty, staff, students. Uh, the plan seems to have been well received, and we are hard at work implementing uh, the, the the things that we came up in there. Um, I mentioned behavioral science and hiring of Alex Todorov. Uh, in general, the behavioral science area has been one that we have done spectacularly well in, uh, in terms of just creating an incredible cohort of faculty. Uh, we're also, you know, during this year, uh, going to complete our new uh, downtown storefront behavioral science lab. So this is going to be across the street from the Art Institute of Chicago. It's the first time any school in the, anywhere in the world has done this, create a downtown campus that serves both as a lab for doing experiments and as a way to teach people about behavioral science research, right? So uh, we're very excited about that and uh, we hope to be able to finish that in, in April. Um, so to, to conclude and before I turn it over to Penka, I wanted to just speak to the importance of the, the annual fund. Uh, this provides critical support for all the things that I'm talking about, right? Not just the ongoing operational things that we're working on, but it also gives us the flexibility to pursue new opportunities as they emerge. So when we hired Sendhil from Harvard Economics, for example, we were able to jumpstart his center on applied artificial intelligence using the resources that we get from the annual fund. Because these funds are uh, essentially unrestricted, it enables us to provide seed money for lots of initiatives. Similarly, the new healthcare initiative that Dan Edelman and Matt Noto are doing would never have been possible without the support that all of you are giving uh, through the, the annual fund. So I'm thrilled to report that if you look at the Reconnect 2020 reunion giving, giving total almost $17.5 million from over 1,700 donors. But this is phenomenal. It, it, far surpassed our union goal, which was closer to 14 million. So I wanted to point out a few classes in particular. Uh, the classes of 1990, 1985, and 1975 surpassed their donor goals by a collective total of 115%. The classes of 1985 again, 1980, and 1975 again, led the charge in most funds raised by reunion classes totaling $11.9 million. And reunion committees from the classes of 1970 and 1980 achieved 100% volunteer donor participation. I'm incredibly grateful for all that you do. Our wonderful community of over 55,000 alumni has made it possible for Booth to get through these times and to come out stronger than ever. You have stepped up by giving your time, by engaging with the school, by mentoring and hiring our students and providing much needed financial support. So I wanted to say thank you for everything that you're doing for Chicago Booth and enjoy this very, very special reconnect this year. So with that, I'm very, very pleased to bring in uh, Penka Bergman, who many of you know, uh, and Penka is going to ask me some questions. Penka, thank you. Thank you, Mara. Let me add my personal welcome to all of you to reconnect 2020 from London. I'm sitting here in my living room and soon I will be in the new spectacular London campus. My name is Pinka Bergman. As I mentioned, I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and it is my great pleasure to be here with you, Madaf, today during WeConnect. First of all, a huge thank you to all my team members and the uh, wider Booth uh, community for turning our annual flagship WeConnect event into a very engaging virtual program. We're all pleased to have you here. We have about 1,300 of you from 57 countries participating in the next 24 hours. I would say that's pretty amazing. Incredible. Madhav, thank you so much for opening um, this great program today. And before I turn uh, the, over the questions, I wanted to just say that it has been an amazing experience to have global alumni connect with the school in these new ways. And we know that you're all very invested in the success of the community. So please uh, thank you from me again. Now over to the questions, Madhav. We have received a lot of follow-up questions about the student experience. Mm -hmm. So if you could elaborate a little bit, you mentioned some of the uh, things that have been happening, that the, this class has been the biggest in a long time, and that obviously we had to pivot to new forms of engaging the students. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on what is working? Were there some challenges? How have the faculty adjusted 
how are the students reacting to this new virtual environment? And how are the international students able to participate if they were not able to come to the US? Yeah, thank you. So I think the student experience has been uh, honestly better than expected. And I say that not this is in my uh, opinion of that. We survey the students frequently. And in general, I would say the students have been happy with the experience. But, but let me go backwards first. If you, if you go back to the spring, I think the change that we had to make in the spring was a very hard one, right? We had to, within the matter of a week, completely change everything that we were doing, go to the faculty and tell them, hey, you have to switch now to a, a mode of teaching which you've never done before. So some, one of the things that makes me very proud, Penka, is we literally did not cancel a single class in the spring quarter. So every faculty member agreed to do the teaching and every faculty member agreed to make the switch to the new teaching modality. I would say that when, so in the spring as well, we surveyed the students sort of three weeks into the quarter at the end of the quarter. In general, the students were very happy with the new format in the sense that it, they, the faculty were still able to engage the students. The students were still able to learn and have a deep academic experience with them. One of the worries about the, uh, the remote format is the notion that, well, the students would just sort of sit back and it becomes like you're watching TV rather than you're participating in a class. So to get over that, it, you know, it takes a lot of effort on the part of the students and the faculty. And I'm very happy to say that that seems to have been the case. Uh, we were, I think, pretty unique among the schools in not changing our uh, grading curve, right? A lot of schools said, oh, let's go to pass fail. Our faculty refused to do that, right? So we. So we actually you know, graded all the students. The faculty put in an incredible amount of effort to make sure that the students would continue to learn through the format. And I think it worked really well. One of the great things that happened is that at some point, the faculty realized that, hey, we can actually use this to our advantage. For example, we could bring in maybe guest speakers who otherwise might have not wanted to fly into Chicago just for, a, for an hour and a half or three hour session and fly back. So they were able to bring in great guest speakers using the virtual modality. Anil Kashyap, for example, had Janet Yellen come in to his banking uh, class mm. right, to share her thoughts. So faculty realized, hey, there are some new things we can do with this modality that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And, and I would say that this autumn, it's actually gotten even better. right? We had the whole summer to actually plan for this because we knew we would have to do a lot of uh, online teaching. So the faculty prep for it. We put a lot of resources into instructional design and IT support for them. And I think the students also came in knowing more about what they wanted from this modality. So I think overall, it's been a success. What's been a surprise to us is that we put a lot of time and effort into making sure that every student who wanted to actually come in person could do so. So we set up a complicated algorithm so that every student who wanted to actually sit physically in a classroom and, and attend the class could do so. Much to our surprise though, the percentage of students who actually took us up on that, even if they had committed to it, has been decreasing every week. So it peaked in week one, but every week since then, the number of students who actually come to class has been going down. Um, so I think one of the things we're learning from it is that students would like to be in class, provided everybody else is in class and the instructor is there. But they would much rather just have it being all everybody on Zoom rather than these sort of hybrid models. So that's something we certainly did not expect. We, as I said, we put a lot of resources into this hybrid model. But people seem to be voting with their feet saying, e, you know what, I would rather just stay you know, in my, in my lovely apartment in Millennium Park Plaza and, and take the class than having to come in and, and do this. So, that's something, honestly, we did not expect. Uh, we've also been doing a lot in terms of trying to create a community, which is very, very important, right? Uh, and so we've been trying to do events where faculty uh, will spend an hour and talk to students about a topic of interest to them. So we have faculty members giving seminars on Italian red wines. We have faculty members giving seminars on Australian rules football. Um, and, you know, just as a way to have small groups of students and sort of keep them engaged. Um, so overall, I think we've done a decent job under the circumstances. Uh, and also, I would say Chicago till about a week ago, students could still go out, you know, socialize to a reasonable extent. And that helped tremendously. Whereas in the spring, we had sheltered in place. So nobody could go and do anything. 
uh, you probably also, some of our students did probably too much of that socializing, and so we had to uh, pull back on that a little bit. But, but I think overall it's gone about as well as we could have expected, probably a little bit better than that. I would totally uh, agree with you, Madhav. I was super impressed early in the early days when the faculty switched so quickly to teaching from their living room, their bedroom, their home office. And it was a very short amount of time that we had to make this happen and the community really came together. And also the alumni relations team, we have been doing virtual meetings, we have been working with our volunteers to create amazing virtual programming. So thank you again to all the volunteers, you've done an amazing job. And we're realizing there are some advantages to this format, right? We are reaching people in places where we have never reached them before. We can, as you mentioned, um, bring in speakers that typically don't have time to travel. So it's, it's uh, an interesting um, opportunity. Yep. So uh, another couple of questions that came in for you, Madhav, are around um, our diversity and inclusion efforts. Many alumni have received uh, the action plan that was emailed to them, and they are just wondering if you could summarize a little bit more the initiatives that um, we will be focused on as a school as part of our diversity and inclusion efforts. Sure. So the way I would think about it is in a, when, you, when you think about a corporation, right, you think about diversity in terms of, you know, the sort of employees there. For us, it's actually very, very different because we have three different groups or, of, of we people, sort of three different labor pools, if you will, that we uh, deal with or work with. So we look at students, for example, right? How diverse is the student body? How do you make sure that you bring in a group of uh, students who are the best people who could come to booth regardless of where they are from or what the race is or gender is? So that those efforts are typically directed through our admissions office, you know, Donna and people like that. They try to sort of do that. And, and that exists as sort of one body. And then you think about Booth's own staff, right? The people who work at Booth. And how do you think about making sure that that's an inclusive community? And that's typically managed through our HR, although at Booth now there is such interest in this topic that uh, we have people from outside volunteering, setting up committees to come up with, uh, with programs for the staff in the space. And then there is a third bucket, which is the faculty, which is again very, very different from the other two. Um, and how do you think about diversity on the faculty side, right? So I would say that the faculty side, because faculty recruiting is directed by the faculty themselves and the groups, that occurs very, very differently than any of the other two. Um, in general, on the faculty side, if I think about it, we've done a pretty good job of improving diversity, particularly on the junior faculty side. Given the way the tenure clock works, right, when you hire somebody into booth, it takes them nine or 10 years before they actually become senior. So it's much harder to make changes at that level directly. Um, and so the way it works is that you bring in junior faculty and then you mentor, you, you, you train them so that they can become the senior faculty. And there, I think particularly on the gender side, we've done very well. Our junior faculty are incredibly diverse compared to our senior faculty particularly. So while our overall numbers, if you look at the number of women, it's probably around 20%. I think for the junior faculty, it's probably close to 35%, even maybe higher than that. And I think that's just going to keep increasing. Uh, and also we've, just recently promoted a number of women to the associate professor level, which is the level just before tenure. So within a few years, I think you're going to see a complete change as well. Uh, so that's working well. Uh, I would say where we have not done as well is that, you know, in terms of like uh, race, in terms of hiring faculty of color. Uh, and, you know, that's a problem at Booth. It's a problem, frankly, with the, with the industry. Uh, and the way to change it is therefore at the level of how do you bring in new people into the PhD program, right? We only hire people who have PhDs. So you really have to make change happen, change the set of people who come into your PhD program. Uh, and there are, we've actually done quite a bit this summer. And, you know, I won't take credit, Pietro Veronesi, who's the, our deputy dean, has done an amazing job setting up this new, what he calls a pre-doc program, which is how do you bring in underrepresented minorities in as research professionals who will then become PhD students. So the initiative that Pietro has put together is something that I think now 20 different universities have signed on to. And this is something that he kind of pioneered. So I think this is going to have a huge impact going forward, uh, changing the pipeline of people, uh, you know, just having a lot more uh, faculty members of color that we would then be able to hire. 
Uh, and, but we're also looking at adjunct faculty, right? People who come in to teach courses of interest. Uh, and they're actually, uh, just this past year, uh, we've hired, I think, uh, maybe three or four, I'm not sure, uh, new faculty who are adjuncts who are black, who will be teaching classes at, uh, at Booth. And again, what we don't want is that we, we say, oh, come in and teach a class on diversity, right? That's not the point. We want them to be teaching classes that uh, are in areas that they're specialists in. So we have a new global health class, for example, that's going to be taught by two faculty members uh, from the from U Chicago Medicine, uh, who just happen to be black. So I think that that's something that we're going to do increasingly is bring in more adjunct faculty into into that space. That sounds great. And our alumni are telling me that they are ready to help when we uh, need their help and we want to engage them. And they're also asking, um, are there some new ways that they can engage with um, faculty and students as we're embarking on this virtual teaching journey and possibly a hybrid model going forward? And that was another question. What 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 are some of the opportunities that we see as a school from this period that we might take over to a post-pandemic world? It's a great question, and I think it's the uh, million-dollar question for all of us. Uh, as Penka said, right? I mean, as you said, Penka, some things just work better with the, in this new world, right? Which we didn't know. I think we're able to have much greater alumni reach in this new world uh, by doing these virtual events. Uh, when we did the economic outlook virtually, I think we had like thousands of people who signed up for it, right? As opposed to, you know, 500 who might come to a big ballroom in Chicago. So I think those we will definitely keep doing. Um, so I think, you know, doing more alumni events, whether it's small events, large events, doing more outreach, we will continue to do through technology. Uh, the other area where alumni could be of great help is if they are interested in being, you know, uh, guest speakers in a class, if they're interested in being guest lecturers, if they're interested in doing a session for a student club, if they're interested in mentoring a small group of students. So typically we've relied on people coming to Chicago to do those things. But as we've realized now, we don't need to do that. The pool of alumni that we can use to do these things is just much, much greater. So to the extent any of you has an interest in volunteering to do any of that stuff, right? Do you want to mentor a student team in the, you know, connected to entrepreneurship or to not-for-profit boards, you know, the social sector more broadly? Do you want to give a, a, a talk to the credit club? Whatever it is, we can now take advantage of you, right? So we, we, we would love for you to step forward and point out things that speak to you what are your passions how would you like to stay engaged is it to connect with a specific faculty member to connect with a student club uh do you want to think about recruiting students virtually because that's moved virtual as well in all of those ways i think this has frankly been a boon for us penka in learning that hey we can you know do a lot more in terms of engaging alumni in ways that speak to them and be able to reach a much broader cross-section of alumni than we were able to do before so I suspect that that will continue uh, for sure going forward. I fully agree with you, Madhav. Let us reminisce for a second. You and I, we typically travel a lot and we meet with so many amazing people all around the world. Um, as you're you know, a little bit more grounded these days and you think about our global presence and the University of Chicago centers as well as our Booth campuses, what are some thoughts that you'd like to share with the alumni about our continued global strategy? You have touched a little bit on it, sure. but as we open the new London campus, as we continue our amazing journey in Asia, what are some of the ways that you think we'll be moving forward as a business school and as a leader in this area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we are committed to the, uh, the three location model. <clears throat> if you think about Chicago, London, Hong Kong, um, I think those are the right locations for us. Um, and so for us, the key has been getting the physical infrastructure done, right? If you think about the past 10 years, it's been, you know, making the shift from Singapore to Hong Kong. And then a lot of effort went into putting together the physical infrastructure in Hong Kong, right? Getting the land grant, uh, completing the building, which again would not have been possible without the help of all the alumni on this, uh, on, on this, uh, this, this Zoom. Um, and, and that's done, right? We had the grand opening, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago, almost at this point. And I think, so we're sort of poised there. I think that having put in that infrastructure in Hong Kong has, if you speak to the alumni there, Penka, they're thrilled, right? They're thrilled that we put a stake in the ground. The level of energy, enthusiasm, willingness to engage of the alumni there is off the charts. Um, 
And we've been able to, because of the new center in Hong Kong, draw uh, uh, students from, I would say, Japan all the way through India. So that's kind of the way I think about the, uh, the, the catchment area, if you will. So we have way more students from Japan than we ever had in, uh, in Singapore. So the move to Hong Kong in one sense was to essentially make that a pan-Asian program. And I think that's, that's doing well. Um, so my trips to Asia going forward will be, last, last time I was there, I went to the Philippines. Because I think that's, again, going to be a great market for us, you know, great set of students that we would love for them to come to Hong Kong. Uh, I was planning to go to Korea this April and Thailand. That was my, those were the two countries. So I think more and more we want to just broaden the set of countries uh, from which we can draw students into the Hong Kong campus. But beyond that, we want the campus to be a, a hub of activity, right? And that's my same aspiration for the London campus. We want these to be locations where everybody in the area says, hey, that's a place where great intellectual activity happens. There are great conferences. There are great seminars. There's just a lot of intellectual activity going on, and I want to be a part of that. So that's my goal for both of the campuses. The EMBA programs will continue to be sort of the core of what we do, but I think it's not success if that's all we're doing, right? The, right? the goal is really that we want to be a global school. We want to attract students globally, but we also want to have a global presence. If I look at London, for example, Penka, as you know, the goal is not just that that's the hub for what we do in the UK, but a hub for everything we do in EMEA. So we're increasingly drawing students from Africa, right, to the uh, EXP program, right? We have a lot of students mm -hmm. from Nigeria now. So I think that's, that's something we want to continue to keep doing, getting students from, you know, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, from Egypt to, to come to the London campus. And also have the London campus be, as I said, a hub of activity have non-degree executive programs running in that campus, have companies use that as a basis, as a place where they do their own conferences. Um, again, think of Gleacher as the model. We want the London campus to be like Gleacher. Uh, I've also talked to Dean Boyer, the dean of the college, and, and I've told them, look, if you want to use the London campus as the base for uh, study abroad for U Chicago, we're happy to do that. And again, that just means that there's always going to be activity in the campus. One of the negatives of Woolgate uh, was, as you know, we would have a lot of activity and then it would go away for a while, right? And there'd be nobody there for a while, then it would pop back up again. We would like something where there is more of a continued level of activity. And again, if you're an alum in Europe, if you want, if you're thinking about doing a conference in London, if you're thinking about doing sort of any event or even like an alumni club doing events, we want you to think of the London campus as a place to do it. That's why when we left Woolgate, we decided to go big, right? I mean, I, in our view, we had a faculty committee study it, and they said, look, it's go big or go home, right? Just continuing to do what you were doing is not the answer. And we decided to go big in true Chicago fashion, right? So the new place is bigger. It's nicer, if I may say so. Um, better location, uh, more classrooms, conference centers. And again, that's ultimately the goal, thank God, that we're a, great, we're a school where great things happen in Chicago, but we're also a school where great things happen in Hong Kong and in London. I fully agree. I think this is a great time to be a member of this community and an active member. So Madaf, last question before we close out, and this is a little bit of a personal one. So during the last several months, we've all maybe hopefully had a little bit more time. So I haven't been traveling much. I've been reading many, many books. And I've been really discovering some nuggets here and there. Share with us a couple of things that you have been passionate about outside of your uh, amazing work as Dean. Maybe you have some recommendations on books, movies, anything. What, ah. what you have been doing for fun? So uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I tend to watch bad television. So I'm happy to give recommendations on junk TV if that would interest people. Um, so I did, I did, so a couple things. I, uh, I'm reading a book now called The Transaction Man, uh, which is interestingly a book David Booth recommended to me. Um, it's an interesting book about how the, the, how the US, how corporations in the US have sort of changed over time. And, and it contrasts sort of, you know, the notion of the organization man, you know, which is the big US corporates that used to run the, the country you know, back in the 50s and 60s with, with what's powerful today is the notion of a transaction man whose, whose job is to be like a consultant. You, you go in, you figure out the frictions and you want to solve it and you move on, right? And, and, and the book puts people like people in private equity, right? 
venture capital, people who try to do disruptive things in industries as transaction people. They're not interested in being a big company and you know doing that for the rest of their lives. They want to find interesting areas, find problems and solve them. So I've been reading that book. It's a great history of sort of the US, you know, and how the US has evolved from say the 1920s onwards. It kind of begins with the standard oil antitrust case and, and sort of goes forward. So if that's your taste, I would I would recommend that you uh, read it. Um, I, I've also been watching, you know, bad television, as I said. Uh, so um, <laughs> one of the really bad shows that uh, that I like was Tiger King. I don't know if that's available on Netflix where you all are, but uh, if you are, you should watch it. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. And it shows you a world that I'm sure you never knew existed. So I, I would highly recommend that. Great. Thank you, Madhav. It was a pleasure talking with you. No, no, Penka, thank you for taking the time. And, and, and again, thank you to the, all of the alumni on this, uh, on this meeting and to all the alumni around the world who do so much to make Chicago Booth the great school it is. Again, we could not do any of the things we're doing without your help, support, backing. So I'm deeply grateful to you. Uh, and I hope that you enjoy the Reconnect program that you'll have for the next day. Thank you.